Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with knife modding power couple, Lindy Lou and Richie B. Now, Lindy and Richie run Knife Modders, a much in-demand aftermarket detailing and modification service that will make your favorite knives unique and one-of-a-kind, just like you. Uh, Not to be corny, but that's what they just did for me. And I first met Lindy and Richie on Thursday Night Knives and followed their work as individuals on Instagram, but recently they combined their powers and made their business official. And that's when I was lucky enough to get on their books and get a spot to turn my Monterey Bay Knives uh, Turbo, which is a very respectable, beautiful, well-built knife, into something truly transcendent and all mine. Highfalutin it might sound, but uh, you know I could stare at the green they anode on my handle for days. So we're going to find out how they do all this stuff and how they got into it. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and then download us uh, wherever you listen to podcasts so you can continue the conversation if you can't see it all here. And then join us on Patreon if you like what we do and if you think it's worth supporting. You get a lot of extra content, like you'll get a little bit of extra conversation with Lindy and Richie uh, from our conversation tonight and other perks. Uh, so check us out on Patreon. Quick way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Thank you. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Oh, yeah, indeed. Lindy, how's it going? Hi. Um, He's running out to let our roommates know that we're going to go on this podcast with you and to not... Sorry about that. (laughs) Hey, that's all right. I was like yelling out in the hallway and we just wanted to let them know. So, so uh, you say uh, Richie and Lindy there. I'm going to say Lindy and Richie because that's how I've always done it. Hope you don't yeah. mind. No, it's fine. Yeah, that works. Hey guys, welcome to the show. I, 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 I want to say congratulations <laughs> on making such a spectacular knife. So I got to I got to start this off by showing it off, which I've been doing a lot. And actually, this light is probably not the best for it. But uh, I sent this to you. This was the plainest of Janest. Uh, Monterey Bay Knives Turbo, a beautiful, beautiful knife designed by Peter Carey, one of my favorites. And uh, but, you know, something I will never be able to own, probably a Peter Carey knife. You guys turn this into something that feels one of a kind and 100 percent special to me with this uh, this crazy green. I asked for sort of a Statue of Liberty green or a l- electric green mm-hmm. and uh, and a stonewash blade, acid stonewash blade. And then uh, turned you loose, so to speak, on the clip and the backspacer. When you asked me what what I wanted, I said, I don't know. Show me what I want. And you guys did a beautiful job. So uh, I want to thank you in person. I've, yeah, I've of course. S- said it in video before, but thank you for this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah awesome. Um, yeah, it was fun to work on. Uh, yeah. yeah, the Lightning Anno is kind of our uh, original like mod, what kind of like started us off mm-hmm. uh, doing this modding thing. It was like we saw that and we just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And we had to figure out how people did it. So that was kind of where it started. Uh, So, yeah, went with our staple mod and threw that as a little accent on the backspacer and clip. Well, okay. so this is something I've been wondering. How how did you break down? How do you break down uh, the labor and the different uh, tasks that come in? Because. People, man, they know what they want. I, I, if you got to go look at uh, the Knife Modders Instagram page, you'll see all of your favorite knife models on there. But tr- turned into uh, into unique versions of these, and and you can tell that the owners of these knives really want you to pull out all the stops. Yeah. So, so how how did you get into like m- doing this as a business? It kind of escalated. So it started um, as a hobby, like we were just playing around here and there. And then we had a couple people asking like, hey, could you do the lightning ammo on our knife? And so it slowly kind of developed on its own. Like, what do you want to say? Yeah, yeah. Here? So we started on Reddit. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. And what we do initially was we would buy knives for really cheap oh. that were really beat up. Mm-hmm. And then we take them in. We do a lightning ammo like maybe an acid stone wash on the blade or something, depending on the condition. And then we'd resell them, make a little money off that. Um, and then 
it kind of just snowballed from there. We went on to Instagram. Uh, we had like our old accounts from, you know, when we were in high school and stuff, we just started using those. Yep. Uh, and then and we were both modding simultaneously. And so we realized that we were competing against each other and it didn't make <laughs> sense that I like am taking orders potentially away from him and he's potentially taking orders away from me. So before that, before we made the knife modders account, we were, uh, so actually on Reddit, I was selling one of the knives I modded and I gave the guy my, or I, I uh, yeah, I gave the guy, or maybe I was buying a knife. Uh, but yeah, anyways, we exchanged addresses and he's like, oh dude, I literally live like two minutes down the street from you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, this guy, Rob. Um, and so we, we hung out and then he told me about uh, MBK. I had heard of them, of course, but I had never gone down to Carmel Cutlery. That's a shop in Carmel. But anyways, he uh, he told Sanford about me and he wanted to meet us. So we drove down there and uh, met up with him. And he was looking for like a modder to, you know, mod his knives, um, you know, just to bring more attention to his business and, yeah. you know, do something Add unique and cool. Flavor. But at that point, we were yeah. only doing like acid stone washes lightning and lightning anodes. And we were kind of like, yeah, we're not like, you know, we can anodize and do this. And he was looking for someone that could do like full on mods, like everything. So after that point, I was just like, shit, we kind of like blew that like yeah. we shouldn't have been more we confident didn't sell and, like, ourselves enough. We yeah. just were so, shy. so we so we started i just like went crazy after that point i just started buying like a compressor a blast cabinet everything cool. and then the next time i saw him i was like yeah i have all this and i could do all this now so that kind of kicked everything off and we realized from that point we could do this make this into a business yeah now i i'm all for the concept of um you know, you're never ready for important, challenging things. You know, right. uh, I learned that in marriage. I learned that in, uh, in having kids. I learned that in my job and also in my hobbies. Um, but in the in this case, I think you were wise not to just say, "Yeah, we can do that," because you're dealing with a bunch of expensive knives. And if yeah. you yeah. jack them up, you jack them up, and you're going to owe them money, or you're never going to get hired again. So exactly, it seems like this was uh, a wise choice. That's something that, like, I think I just lost my train of thought. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, after that point, um, uh, we uh, so we were talking with Sanford, talking about how we wanted to a, make like a joint account. Cause at, at this point, like, we, we're become pretty much family with Sanford. Yeah. Like, we talk to each other on the phone every day. We, we go to his family's house and yep. have barbecues. We go over there and do QC and he makes dinner for us. And he's yep. just like, an the, awesome. He's, awesome dude one of the best people i've ever met like he is an awesome dude um so yeah we were all talking in a group chat like trying to figure out a name for the account and like we're terrible with coming up names if you look <laughs> at our like mod names they're just like awful it's like, terrible. We can't like come up our blast and cool. tumble finish it's just b and t it's like we're not clever <laughs> but uh so yeah. Uh, yeah, Sanford threw the name out there, Knife Modders, and I was just kind of like laughing, like, oh, maybe he's just joking or something. Or that's and then, taken. There's yeah, no or way it's taken. that's not right. taken. So yeah. we go and check, and sure enough, it's there, and we're like, wow, that's like a perfect name, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not the kind of thing you want to be too mysterious about, you know? Yeah. Why, why bother? Like, And if Knife Modders isn't taken, man, that gets right to the point. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and you can't, you can't say, like, knife modder yeah it's like oh i'm thinking about business. i'm thinking about going to a knife modder it's like well why don't you use knife, knife modder? Yeah, it's just <laughs> yeah, exactly. it just works. so were you both collecting i mean so how did were you collecting before you got together did one of you introduce i mean i'm getting personal here but did one of you introduce <laughs> the other to knives or were you uh were you two <laughs> people drawn together by knives no so well, he was into knives first and he was he's got what the kershaw league the kershaw blur and slowly kind of escalated from there <laughs> so i think it was like two and a half years ago yeah. i started watching like videos like ltk nick love the knives nick mm -hmm. shabazz that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but at that point i had no money like we were broke like completely broke uh, -huh. uh so we were buying like gonzos and stuff like that it's like I don't know. When I get into hobbies, it's like I always do all this research to find out what's like the cheapest but the best. So that kind of like, thing for your buck. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was watching a lot of YouTube videos, and Lindy like couldn't stand it, didn't want anything. To I do wanted with it. nothing to do with it. It was I was so over it, and he was like brainwashing me with all the nice stuff. And I just I remember going job, from, like strenuously, like I mean strenuously trying to ignore it. So like one day turning on Nick Shabazz video on like on my he went to work and then I turned on a Nick Shabazz video to watch. 
And then it kind of just went downhill from there. <laughs> you're like, sometimes I just like to put Nick Shabazz on in the background. And yeah, about my business. <laughs> but I mean, you're, you're pretty easygoing and you kind yeah. of just like pick up on things. Well, and you don't really like, I don't know. No, you're no, not no. like heavily against I wasn't anything. mean about it or anything, yeah. but it was just like, I don't know. I didn't have, I didn't have any knowledge about it whatsoever, but I knew that he was really into it. And so I've always been supportive, obviously, of like whatever he wants to do. Yeah. And so he was super excited about it and wanted to explain all this knowledge that he had just gained from Nick Shabazz and LTK and like steals and all that stuff. And I was just, I was listening, but I didn't really get it. And then one day he sent me to work with a gonzo. And at the time I was working in shipping and receiving. So I was like, opening and tearing down like hundreds and hundreds of boxes per like eight hour shift. So I got to really like use and like experience the knife and like how useful they were. And I remember coming home that day and then just like sitting down and like pretty much taking out a notebook and like writing notes. And he was explaining steels and G10 and how to spidey flick and like all this stuff, you know? <laughs> and, cool. um, and then I kind of, I don't even know what happened from there. I, we started buying knives. I was so well, excited. You, you actually bought like what we would oh, consider yeah. at the time. She bought like a high-end knife before I did. So what for us back then, like a hundred dollars was a high-end knife, you know? Yeah. Sure. So she, she like, cause I, I think, you know, what I would consider like most of the knives I had were in lower end steel. And then I got, an, I got a knife in D2, that, my first knife in D2. At the same time, she bought like a Ferrum Forge uh, drop. drop buck yeah. with S35. Oh, wow. So I was like, shit. <laughs> I, yeah, I know, I got a titanium, like super steel, you know, all that stuff. I, oh, yeah, God. she's like, Richie, why are you half stepping? This is what you want to do. Yeah. 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 I know. I remember like scrolling for hours trying to find the perfect knife. And I saw the, I think it was the Dow. The mm -hmm. first one I got was the Ferrum oh, Forge yeah. Dow. Oh yeah, yeah, the Dow. That's, and then, that's, a, um, that's a cool knife. Yeah, yeah it was so fun. I, I was so excited to bring it to work and like use it. And then it ended up getting stolen. It was she so like sad. set it down. And then... Yeah, I set it down at work and then I turned around and it was gone. I, was like, mm -hmm. I mean, I was working mm -hmm. at like a dollar tree and shipping and receiving. So I mean like, I don't know. I shouldn't have set it down. That was yeah. stupid on my phone, on my part. Probably, but. I, I bet you wouldn't do that again if you had to go back Heck to that. No. Dollar. Oh my god! No. So, all right, let's let's talk about these processes, processes yes. that you do. Uh, and I want to start with the handles, um, because to me, that's where that's where the rubber meets the road, and it's also where I see the most crazy unique stuff happening yes. with you guys yeah uh, that's that's not to say there isn't some exquisite stuff happening on the blade side there is but there seems to be a lot more uh sculpting and variation and stuff right um uh so i'll start the conversation with the texturing tell us about the different texturing you do my yeah. favorite is the bark yeah. i love that bark texture. oh do we have any yeah bargain? so do i have any bark? I don't no think I do. um oh, but yeah. we'll, so we'll, barking, we'll scroll your page and show it yeah sure oh yeah um so for the barking that was, um, you know, I had seen people do different types of barking. There's a lot of different types of barking out there. Styles, and I, I felt guess. like I didn't have the tools to do it at the time. So, nice. um, <laughs> so I, uh, I've just experimented and figured it out. And then it kind of evolved to the cross barking. And, um, and then we have stuff like rhino skin, which is something I just completely messed around and figured it out. Cause I hadn't seen anything very similar to that. Um, yep. And then, of course, you can do other finishes on top, like, you know, black washes, or you can blast it with uh, aluminum oxide and tumble it. You can anodize uh, it. You can do all anodize kinds of it. Things. You can sand the flats and anodize it. Uh, what what actual tool are you using to, to dig into the titanium? So um, there's a few ways we do it. We're not going to like go into detail and yeah. disclose how it's done. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily need that. But but I yeah. look at some of the texturing and I swear to God, I see you with a little chisel and a mallet. like, <laughs> And I know that's not what you're doing. No. Yeah, th there is a few ways to do it. Uh, you can do it on a belt sander as well. Yes. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, ours is uh, unique from what I've seen from other people. Well, right on. We will keep that. <laughs> we will keep that a trade secret. That's pretty cool. Yes. Um, so I, 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 this knife in particular, uh, I, now I have no regrets, certainly, but this knife in particular or anything with a contoured uh, titanium handle, I feel would be uh, a, a great candidate for that treatment in particular because it's evocative of a tree with the yeah. roundness and then, and then the bark. I just think it's... Uh, it's beautiful, but you also have been advertising, if that's the right word, but really uh, featuring your um, fragging, your frag mm -hmm. pattern. Mm -hmm. 
So here, this isn't finished. This is like fresh off the mill. Um, so this is mm -hmm. our larger frag that we do. I would say that's like mid, mid size. Mid size. I, don't know. I think this is like a good larger size. You know, because the Spidey Chef we did was large. Oh yeah, that's true. Oh, that is very true. Um, we also do smaller frag, which would be like the squares are smaller and closer together. Um, but this is like a sweet spot. I yeah, like this yeah, I would say lot. so too. There's a lot of factors on the sizing, so you can either use a smaller end mill, so you get like small the lines themselves are smaller and then you can also do spacing differences so you can change the size of the lines themselves and the size of the squares as well and then obviously when you uh do closer together spacing you can get more squares out of it and they'll just be smaller mm -hmm. um so yeah there's quite a few different ways you could do it and then also finishing of course you can anodize you get blast it and tumble it which is my favorite look mm -hmm. you can um, ceramic coat it we do ceramic coating too so you can ceramic coat it and all that stuff the but uh, the frag it seems like there's some difficulty in that uh because uh, the reason i i assume that is that it seems like something everybody wants but not too many people offer i mean like yes. for a while it was just something like oh my gosh you have to you have to spend your life savings at monkey edge to get a frag pattern and then it, <laughs> yeah. and then it started to you know a little bit but is there is there a special challenge with that the kind money. of frag pattern yeah it's so money. i mean you have to get a mill obviously <laughs> mill which is, is you're gonna spend at least i don't know you, you could get a, a lower end mill for like 800 bucks from harbor freight yeah. but you're gonna have to do a bunch of mods to to bring it up to where you want it the harbor freight ones have plastic gears which break mm -hmm. and then the digital readout is a huge thing Game otherwise changer. you're going to be looking at your wheel as you're turning it counting each revolution um, so the digital readout tells you exactly where you're positioned on the X and Y, which is, you know, Y forward, forward and backwards, and then X side to side. Um, yeah. So you can use that to guide you which, and when gives having, you the exact yeah. spacing. And then um, with the DRO, it adds to the cost ultimately, which is like, so you're typically going to spend like, what, 15 to like $3,000 for like a decent mill? Yeah. So for a, a mini mill, like, yeah, around around mill. that area. Yeah. Uh, is which that is like a desktop have. or not desktop, but like something you could put on a yeah, work yeah, table? Yeah, yeah. A bench yeah, top yeah, mill. Because no. um, mm -hmm. we, we work in a pretty small shop. Very so small. if we had gotten a bigger one, it would have taken up a lot of space. But uh, the other challenges involved with it, the hardest part for me personally is work holding. So actually mounting the scale um, to mill it. Yeah. It's because like if you use fasteners like the screws, you're going to have to either go through the screw because you want you want the frag to continue through yeah. the pivot. Because yeah. yeah. Monkey Edge actually, they stop before it hits the pivot. But I, I like the look of it going all the way through. Yeah. So, in that situation, you either have to like remove the screw and put it into another location or clamp it down. Mm -hmm. um, and then another thing with the mill is everything has to be perfectly flat. If you get, mm -hmm. you know, even a 2000s variation, you're going to see it in the frag itself. Yeah. Right. It right. won't be as deep. And then it's just going to look, line it's gonna look funky. The, the square will look bigger or, yeah. so it is, it's very involved and it takes hours to do. Um, so it yeah it's definitely uh, takes some uh, practice to yeah. to learn how to use it. I'm yeah. still in the There's very beginning curve. stages. I, I want to start doing all sorts of different milling patterns, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm time just hasn't learning here and yeah. it's taking some time. <laughs> yeah. Well, like in our free time, that's like what we want to start doing is experimenting more. Like how we used to when we first started was just like having fun with it and experimenting and doing, you know, finding new mods to do. Cause that is something that I think is really important to the business to stay relevant is that there's a lot of trends that happen in the net community as far as like what people want, like frag is one of them right now. So is rock patterning. And, you know, after that dies down, it's just, we need to find other things to keep people's attention. And just, so now we're trying to find like a, a balance between our work life, and then our play experimental, you know, like with different milling patterns and things like that. Um, and which is great because we have had a lot of business, which is great, but it also doesn't leave us much time to like play like we used to. Yeah, because we have a lot of stuff that we want to do. Yeah. And that's just, we have the material or whatever tools we need to do it and we have it all, but it's just, we don't really have the time to <laughs> practice as much anymore. Yeah. Well, uh, you hear that a lot from, um, knife makers in the um adolescence of their career so to speak where they've just gotten over the you know when they when they first hit and people are interested in their work 
they have to take as many orders as possible to ensure their career, you know, to ensure right. that they're going to move forward. But at the same time, that's a that's an albatross around your neck. You know, you you have to do those orders, uh, have to get all that stuff out. And that could take years, uh, you know, in that initial <laughs> book. And uh, during that period of time, you have no time for what you're talking about experimenting. Yeah. So maybe maybe that's what you have to maybe these are the dues you're paying right now, because I saw on your page not accepting new orders. Yeah. Like, these guys are busy and you can tell like the way you're cranking out pictures mm -hmm. and new work every day. Uh, so maybe this is something you got to go through. And then when your books are clear, then you can parse out time to to right. figure out you know, the next genius uh, pattern. Yeah, because at, at this point right now, it's like uh, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to do it with opening books. We always, you know, in the beginning, we were thinking we want to just be able to have our books open always. And people can just you hit can us just, up yeah. and just tell us what they want. And they send it in immediately. And there's no like, you know, waiting or anything like that. But it's just gotten to the point where it's like insane. Yeah. Like, yeah. We thought we thought so. We closed our books. They've been closed for what months. couple months now. Three months almost. You know, we had thought maybe after a month we'd be able to open them back up. So we did start slowly accepting orders again, and we were going to work up to it and then just open them all the way. But it just it got crazy. So we started a wait list, and now that wait list is getting crazy. <laughs> so we're trying to get through uh, what we have and then yeah. get through that wait list. And then we might have to figure out a different way to like take book spots. Yeah, book spots. We'll make a post and then, you know, who, whoever says in first, you, we'll have 30 or, book spots. And then, you know, or we'll yeah. do like a random number generator thing. So we give people 24 hours. Everyone who wants to enter can enter. And then we'll, you know, pick 40 or however many we want to choose. So yeah, we're still trying to figure it out, but uh, we might have to do something like that just yeah. to make it, uh, you know, easier on us yep because storage right now it's the big the biggest thing is storage right now we don't oh, have yeah. a lot of space in order to like we want to take everybody's knives but to help keep us organized and to just maintain what we have going we gotta keep it you know contained <laughs> yeah and I, and I also imagine it's a bit of a liability having a whole bunch of yeah. other people's expensive knives just hanging around yep. um you know so uh, yeah i could see how you would want to maintain a small enough uh, bit of traffic that you're not you're not getting bogged down yes. um okay so uh the anodizing let me ask you I, i'm still on the handles here uh i want to ask you about the anodizing now i understand that this green is actually not a very easy color to achieve is that right oh that's true yeah green is like the most finicky it's the worst not the worst Honestly, the most okay, wait, all right. before we get started you have to explain the process for those who don't know and i'm one of them sure, how sure. to anodize titanium so how to anodize titanium so you need an electrolyte solution of some type so we use typically we use baking soda and distilled water is to create the solution you're also going to need some aluminum foil and then some titanium your titanium piece like the scale and um you suspend that in the liquid and it's connected to a power supply and so the wattage of the power supply determines the colors that you get when you put it in the bath. So what happens is it uh, it creates an oxide layer. And then as you go up in voltage, it creates a thicker oxide layer. So green is pretty okay. much, uh, yeah. I so, said wattage. Whoops, yeah. So as you go up in voltage, it creates a thicker oxide layer. So green is pretty much the highest. Um, oxide yeah, layer. Yeah, the highest oxide layer. So it's the thickest oxide layer. So it's also more durable than the Lowest. lower lower colors, which it would be bronze. Right. So that's the gist of it. Um, and so green is like the high, like the last color on the chart. Like that is the ninety-two. It depends on your like how you etch and everything like that. But we typically do ninety-two volts for our green. And in order to do high voltage colors, you have to have a very very clean process because that's where it, you can get tripped up. As if you can wash your piece t two, three, four times, and if you miss one little spot and you put it in the bath, it'll show. And it'll be discolored in that one area. So for it to anodize evenly, you have to have it be very I, I believe the reason uh, people have trouble with those higher um, the higher voltage colors also is because, so they try to anodize it, it doesn't go well. And then from there, they don't have a blast cabinet and they don't really have any way to bring the finish back to what it was. The mm -hmm. only way they could do that generally oh, yeah. for people without a blast cabinet 
is etch it again. And when you it, keep etching it, the surface finish, it just turns to crap. Like, yeah. so then you're pretty much, you're, you're burnt. You're, yeah, you're burnt. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Like you try to anodize, like your surface finish just really is like everything. It really matters. And like how the colors and just how it looks really and etched titanium, especially if you've etched it a bunch of times, it has like a, it's like a frosty, foggy, frosty foggy look. look. Yeah. Froggy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, uh, you mean it won't show the color clearly, or it? It'll it'll just look muted and muddy. It looks matte almost. I don't know how to explain it, but it, it's not as like vibrant. It's not nearly as Especially vibrant. Especially when you over etch with um wink. with with wink and then do a high voltage color, the green will just not not look good. Um, yeah. So yeah, your surface finish plays a heavy role in the finished product for electrolytic and any anodizing for that matter. Yeah. Okay, so what about blades? I know you do acid stone wash because you yeah. did this on mine and I love it. What else do you do? I, I've seen something that I hope you talk about, but I want to. Yes, so <laughs> we, I think our hottest blade finish that we do right now is a mere stone wash. And that is, I think, it is the hardest finish that we do. It's a lot of like labor intensive, takes hours and hours and hours to hand sand the blade to a mere polish. And then we put it in the tumbler afterwards. Um, but it is so rewarding. I think that is my favorite. Blade yeah, that, that we, I would say that's a more like premium finish. It does mm. take a long time. Yes. Um, you know, anywhere from depending on the blade steel, the steel and there's a lot of factors, uh, how blade deep blade. the grind lines are, yeah. all that, but it can go anywhere from five to 10 hours. Um, longer. yeah, wow. hopefully, I mean, most of the time it's somewhere five. in like the five to six hours. Uh, yeah. that's just for the sanding though. And then we also like this, uh, here. So this is carving. This is a Benchmade Anthem and it has some carving down the spine yeah. of the blade to kind of tie in the rock patterning on the scales. And then we also did a blast and tumble over the top. Um, that's another finish that we do. Blasted and tumbled is probably our next biggest one is blasted yeah, and tumbled, definitely. mere stone wash, and then obviously acid etch. And then, I think, what other blade finishers do we do? We do regrinds, re I guess. Yeah, we could also do bead blasts. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Man, I, I've never seen an anthem look so good. I, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a cool knife to start with, but man, mm -hmm. and you reshaped, you reprofiled that blade, also. Uh, that looks I, like I, I think a, no, no, I think that was uh, no, no, that is. Oh, oh yeah, well, I did yeah. the carving. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like the rock um, um, and then. What other, I mean, there's opening, like, so we can do like added thumb studs. Like say you have a flipper knife and you want to turn it on like into thumb studs, depending on the knife, it, if it's capable or if it's. If there's enough clearance, yeah, clearance. between the handle yeah. and the blade. Right. Then we Look can, or we can add a spidey hole or flipper delete, little things like that. Um, so that's the mirror stone wash we're looking yeah, at right that here. that is the mirror stone wash. And then for people who don't know, that's that's what I was referring to when I mentioned that bark yes. pattern to me. Yes. yes. Oh, oh, yeah. There you go. Oh, the cross. Yeah. Cool. Usually when we do barking or rock patterning, if people want to anodize, they usually want it uh, bronze. So that was the first one we had actually done in blue, which is. I love surprising. how that turned out. Yeah, that turned out really I love good. how that looks. Anodized barking. We don't get asked a lot. Usually for barking, we just do our blast and tumble finish. <laughs> um, but with, I think it looks so good with anodized. The only thing is, you know, there's the fingerprint thing. Yeah. But with our blast and tumble, you don't have to worry right. about fingerprints. Yes. So what are your favorite knives to work on? Uh, if you had to, and you don't have to say Monterey Bay knives. We'll just say that that's <laughs> Monterey Bay knives. But uh, yeah. I mean, like when, when something comes in, uh, what are the things that you're ex especially excited to see come in? So I love working on Koenig Arius. Yeah. Those are, they're, they they're just, just they go to part. They take you can take them apart so easily. They go back together so easily. Seamless. And they're just amazing knives. And since it's Thai scales, um, you know, canvas. a lot of texturings you yeah. can do. Um, yeah, I, I love working on Koenigs for sure. Mm -hmm. Um Anything that has uh, tie scales that are not milled out is great because there's so many options. Mm -hmm. See, that's the thing you have to like consider when you're doing those textures. Like depending on how deep it's milled, like it's sometimes okay. you can't do textures at all because you'll just go right through the scale. Um, so yeah, with rock patterning especially, it needs to not be milled that deep or that's I just true. have to be super careful so here is like what our rock patterning looks like and so these scales That's aren't nice. milled out i believe they're, so uh, not. they're not so yeah so this we were able to go a lot deeper on oh these. oh oh i'm sorry to interrupt i get what you mean you're talking about the the light 
the yeah, lightning exactly. pockets on the inside. I, I Sorry, Lindy, I think I frightened you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, weight yeah. relief. Light, yes, right, minimal. right, the weight relief. I was thinking you were talking about uh, if you had a uh, a knife that already had milling on gotcha. the outside, oh, a pattern. Right. And, yeah. But yeah, Sorry. right. So, so uh, for anyone who might be confused, as I was, but uh, I'm sure you weren't because you're following, um, like the in intense, those giant pockets yes. that are milled out yeah. here. Um, they're so deep and they're so excellent for making this a light knife and also the sound, of course, they add to the sound. But if you're on the outside sculpting inward, you have to be wary of busting all the way through. Okay. Yes, I yeah, get it. exactly. <laughs> so what I do now is I just take some calipers and I check the depth and then, you know, I check the entire depth and subtract and then figure out how much I have to work with. Um, usually I'm hoping I could have like, I don't know, at least like 30, 30 thousands. Yeah, 20 to 30 thousands. Um, that's the sweet spot. But when it's not milled out, it's fun because then you can go as deep as you want with rock patterning. And personally, I think the deeper you go with rock patterning, I think the better yeah, it definitely. looks because you have contrast. Right. Um, yeah, the deeper you go, the better with rock patterning. And then it becomes a real texture also for grip. Yeah. You know, it becomes more utilitarian. So yes. uh, Jim just put up a video, beautifully shot, by the way, that your videos look great. Thank uh, you. you have, okay, I, I call it, uh, and I know I haven't coined this phrase, but <laughs> YouTube University to me, like I learn everything on YouTube now and, yeah. I, and I have for years. And uh, you are really living up to that uh, moniker I, it, because you can go to your channel and learn how to do most of this stuff yeah uh, well how did you get into the video aspect of all of this and uh describe describe the path to getting to where you are now in the video side of things um so i have another hobby kind of well i want i was super interested in like videography and stuff like mm -hmm. that i mean i am by no means like I don't know much, but I was went to YouTube Academy and I watched a bunch of YouTube videos, um, like in the photography industry or videography, Peter McKinnon, Peter McKinnon and, um, just other channels alike. Um, and I got super inspired and I figured creating a knife YouTube channel. I don't know. You see all these people like you and just everybody else that has a knife YouTube channel. And I felt super inspired, but I also wanted to have like a higher production quality. And I'm kind of a perfectionist in that sense. Um, so I spent some money or I invested in a nice camera and some lights and stuff. And then slowly kind of just I'm still learning um, the vibe that I want to have with our channel and what we're trying to do with it still. But it's a nice uh, creative outlet, but it's also a way to like humanize Richie and I in the community to bring our faces. With, so people know who we are, you know, and what we're like, because I know on Instagram it's very you can see all the pictures, but you don't really know who we are as people. Yeah, I can't. I, honestly, I can't think of a single modder that has like, you know, that's really into the YouTube community or this small part of the YouTube knife community that really like people know who they are. And I feel like we've done a pretty good job at, uh, you know, showing people who we are. Yeah, we're, we're dorks. We're absolute weirdos. If you watch our live streams, yeah. you know, we are absolute bonkers. Yeah, like, we are crazy. Um, Make, making you fit in perfectly is like with being i don't know we were we're typically kind of shy people like if you were to meet us out in public you know we're just losers but when what's kind of fun is that like we we're able to be ourselves like how we act together with the live streams because there's no one like actually there and i feel like the live streams have definitely i think actually even helped improve like our social ability oh. you know we just feel much more confident and oh, yeah. we have friends and um the knife community is like such a special place like everyone is so like loving and kind and generous and they've been nothing but supportive of richie and i and it's awesome <laughs> yeah that is i i uh i mean i feel the same way about this community of people and and it's uh it's interesting because it's a weird not a weird i shouldn't say weird it is an unusual thing yes. to be to be irrationally fond of i mean i i don't yeah. understand no it. i i say that all the time with richie like i just it'll randomly hit me just like the reality of like this is so weird like why are we just obsessed with sharp pointy fidget toys that we you know but mm -hmm. we all come together and just we love them so much it just doesn't make sense but I mean, it does, but it, it doesn't at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a great enthusiast community because there's little infighting. There's not too much, you know. There's not too much 
bad blood. Uh, it doesn't seem, you know, of course there's no. some here and there, like anywhere else it's made of humans. But, um, you know, I, I, I've been a, uh, you know, I was a martial artist for a long time and that mm -hmm. martial arts world, man, you, you know, uh, it's polarizing people, people, Oh, that kick is ridiculous. Or, you know, my school broke off from that school at a certain time and we cannot have a conversation, you know, without right. it devolving. But, um, I don't know. It seems like the knife world, different place. And, uh, I was going to say the videos are also a great way, obviously to sell your stuff because this is yes. such a visual field and everything you do is specifically that. And that kind of like, happened by accident like i didn't really necessarily create the youtube channel to like reach more people or it was just kind of it kind of just happened that way where um it just kind of turned into a good yeah, thing because she wasn't sure if she was going to be like a reviewer or like what, what exactly what do. direction she wanted to go but um, and then at the time when i first started my youtube channel i was kind of doing reviews a little bit that was before knife modder so that's like and if you go back and you watch the old videos um yeah, <laughs> there's it's just super cringe. Um, so the newer content is much better, and it's more um, niche niched down to like knife mods and stuff like that. But yeah, a lot of the older content was um, so bad, <laughs> so bad. Well, you know, there's a learning curve, and unfortunately, yeah. the whole world gets to see it yeah. for the rest of time. <laughs> yeah, thank God. Oh my gosh. So uh, uh, this this begs the question. Um, uh, you were talking about uh, famous knife modders, so to speak, or or well known knife modders, and of course, my mind went to Tough Thumbs. Oh yeah. And yes. and 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 then there were a couple of other or in in that orbit at that time, but but since then, I, I feel like you guys really are uh, that. Um, as you know, uh, Jeff Blauvelt became tough knives and i think he makes mm -hmm. exquisite knives i love yeah. his his, yeah, his yeah. knives are uh, beautiful. beautiful we the just designs are uh, so good. we just had a custom his uh reset that it's his newer design after his shop was flooded and mm -hmm. um he lost his notebook with all of his designs in it so he had to come up with something new and so he called it the reset because he had to like start over ultimately and it was sent in and oh, it's beautiful. His work is incredible. It's pro. I think that was my favorite custom that I've ever handled. Yeah, it was so nice. That well, okay, we got to bookmark that because I want to ask you about customs and models. <laughs> but but before we get there, um, uh, I just wanted to ask you: Do you have aims? Uh, is this a, a in any? Well, do you have aims to make knives? Um, I think it's in our future at some point, but I'm not sure how far away it'll be. Like, it's just I feel like that's just the the natural transcendence of knife modding. Like, at this point, I know I could make fixed blades. I've done so many regrinds. I, I know I can grind a blade. I know I can make a handle. I just haven't done it. Yeah, we want to <laughs> um, make folders. Yeah, though. I want to make folders. But speaking of that, we do have a knife design uh, in the works that we're going to be having produced overseas. Yes. Uh, and we're hoping to have that, you know, sometime this year. Yes, um, later this year. We're hopefully. still in the early stages of it, but it is going to happen. Yes. So oh, there's that's... going to be a, a Knife Modders production knife. We're not sure of the name or anything yet, because like we said, we're terrible at naming things. But, <laughs> knife, uh, knife One by the Knife Modders. Yeah, KMK, Knife Modders Knife. <laughs> uh, this is exciting because, uh, and I've said this before, that, like I'm really loving the designs that are coming out of knife enthusiasts, yes. such as yourself and, and others, uh, that are being made by awesome, reputable companies. Uh, I love this trend, not trend, but I love that this is happening Yeah, uh, that, uh, be because because all of these little nerdy uh, um, preferences get mm -hmm. not nerdy, specific preferences nerdy. get it's distilled, yes, right. nerdy <laughs> preferences get it's distilled okay. down uh, in, into a knife the way the way knife uh, lovers want to see it. Exactly. And I think that's that sounds great. And and, and not for nothing, but, you know, Monterey Bay knives. So that's pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> Yeah, like 2021, like we've been saying, it, Kev's been saying it, like 2021, yeah, Lefty EDC. Lefty EDC. Um, 2021 was the year of the, what do you call it? The, the boutique. Boutique makers. No, like boutique, so, no. boutique brands. Boutique brands, that's what it was, which is true. You know, all of these knife guys starting their own knife company, like Bureau was one of them, and then MBK and um, EMP. Yeah, EDC, Noel Knives, Noel. all the people that have been, you know, or the gripper guy. I mean, oh yeah, Brass Brigade. Yeah, Brass Brigade. Yeah. Um, and they're all so good. They're so yeah. so good. I love their designs. They're very different. His 
I feel like a lot of the models, um, they kind of start to blend together. And I feel like all of these boutique brands, they're just very unique. And it's very like, it's what the made by the people for the people. And it's perfect. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, they might not look like how, uh, you know, a designer who sits down at Kershaw every day to design knives mm -hmm. makes a knife look. And that's what I love about them too. They're totally unique. Like I'm thinking right now of the lift concepts, uh, knife, you know, um, yeah, the Avant, the Avant, very the Avant. that's what it was very different. Uh, but very like not that different. It also kind of yeah. looked like a spider co, but not, you know, yeah. it's not like it was derivative, uh, but it had some of the same elements and you could tell, okay, this person likes this aspect and this aspect of mm -hmm. this kind of knife and this. And, and so, yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a, an, an exciting thing, but I would put you guys and, uh, and, um, brass brigade and, 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 uh, Casey and others, uh, in a different category than I would Monterey Bay knives and a yeah. couple of others. Yeah. They're yeah, boutique definitely. brands too, but they're, but they're slightly, they're, they're, Bigger. they seem different. Yes. Yeah. No, you know? it is. It is. It yeah. Is Cause those are like established companies yeah, they are that have been around for a little bit. Right, yeah. right. I've done large runs. And then mm -hmm. all these other ones that are coming out are like still one man, you yeah, know, yeah, that's your point. Yeah. one man, one design, mm -hmm. and they're still working their way up. Yeah. And, that, and that's what makes them exciting to, to own because, um, you know, I have a prototype that, that was popular that was going around, uh, that never quite, uh, got funded. Right. And so that, that, design until it's you know resurrected or whatever is lost to history except in the hands of the folks who were lucky enough to get a prototype right, uh, right. and and um so that's also exciting um but but even so even if it does get funded and it's a limited run you have that there's a there's a pride of ownership yeah yes. um, so um yeah so we're not going to be i mean we we have all the money that we're going to need to be doing it so I, we don't have to worry about doing like kickstarter or anything like that yeah, that's nice, uh, yeah. i mean even if we did i think we would do well um, um, I think the design will appeal to a lot of people. I think so too. It's a, it's a very, and what we really want, because obviously we mod knives is that we want a perfect blank canvas for mods. <laughs> yeah. So I, we're planning on holding some of the ones that we order that come in that we're specifically, we are going to mod and then sell, you know, um, I got to make a website. I have to make a website first. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean that's a great idea. Make make a uh, make a blank canvas yes. that you can mod yourself. Other people can mod, or yes. I mean, there I have plenty of plain Janes, and I love plenty of you know I love the plain yeah, Janes too. Exactly. You know? So, so uh, um, let me ask you this now. We we I I touched on it before because you mentioned we were talking about Jeff Blauvelt. What happens when someone sends you a custom knife? Now the reason I ask that is because I've heard different thoughts on it. I've heard. Mm -hmm. Hey, once you buy a custom knife and that thing is your, you know, thing, you can do whatever the hell you want with it. And I agree with that 100%. But at the same time, I also agree with you don't buy a Van Gogh and then and then tweak it with 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 your own paint. So right. how does of course, we're not talking about Van Gogh's here. We're talking about working tools that have aesthetic appeal. So right. how, how do you guys come down on the modding customs thing? So um, a lot of the times when we get sent custom knives in, they're like, there's issues with them or the finish is like trashed on them. So a lot of the They've time for well customs, loved. it'll be like a refurbishing. Yes. Oh, okay. um, so and, and I like to think that we have like pretty tasteful mods and, you know, we're not destroying the knife. No. Like you can always, you know, it, it, after it's done, it's, it's going to look great. Mm -hmm. Um I think there's a lot of people that have tried to mod customs that have ruined them. And then somebody would try to, then the, the owner would try to send the knife in to the custom maker after the guy mm -hmm. modded it. And the, ruined yeah. It. And the, the, um, the maker would see it and he's like, well, what the hell? Like, yeah. You just ruined yeah, it. Yeah. He ruined it. Um, yeah. And that's so, something I think we also kind of take pride in is that that's something like we want our mods to feel like it came just, from the factory, like factory mm -hmm. fresh, like yeah. it, no one's ever touched this knife. Like it is brand spanking new from us, even though, yes, we did touch it. We did mod it, but we try to keep it as tasteful as, as possible. But totally, uh, we, totally we, immaculate too. We, we, uh, we haven't had any uh, issues with custom makers, like hitting us up or anything like no. that. And I, I think most of them are, are cool about it. Um, and most, in our experience yeah anyways. most of the honestly most of the fixes i think we've done is uh carbonizing lock faces so a lot of uh -huh. or just like a blast and tumble yeah we've done some lightning anos but 
Maybe um, our like uh, we've done near stone washes too. Mm -hmm. He's actually working on a custom Rosenti Druid. Mm -hmm. uh, he just did a mere stone wash on it. We've done a, uh, another mm -hmm. mere stone wash on a druid mm -hmm. before, but that's pretty much the extent of like what we do for, or we'll refinish Timascus. So like you did that, um, what was that? That one that you did for Scott? Uh, oh yeah, Casey Gray. A Casey Gray custom that we refinished Timascus, repolished it, re-anodized it, um, but nothing too crazy. Very simple, simple mods. Okay, so I got to ask you, uh, ever have any botched jobs where you just had to eat crow and tell them that you jacked up their knife and, you know? Um, so, yeah, more so in the early days. It doesn't really – these days, if something happens, it's always fixable and nothing like – Because we have the tools. We have – we have – um, what am I trying to say? We have everything at hand that if something were to go wrong, we also now have the know-how. Of like how to fix it and we don't do i mean we, we don't really accept work unless we're super confident, confident in the yeah. mods that we're doing yeah. um of so, course like every other modder we have fucked up some knives <laughs> like, yeah you know? you know but we usually i mean if we accept an order that like maybe it's something we haven't done before we do it on our own knives so like we practice yeah. first on our own stuff to make sure that we're able to do it um yes sorry my cat <laughs> um, I, I can say I have launched some pocket say clips hello. in my shop and have <laughs> never found them to this day after searching for yeah, the eight buffer, hours. The buffer will launch They're it. buried in the ceiling somewhere. Yeah, we, Dude, we, I, we tore apart the whole entire shop, we like tore eight apart hours our plus. water heater, like, thinking <laughs> it fell into the water heater. We ended up, you know, we got a custom clip made for the guy, and which is, it was even better. It was yeah, like it was a, a stock Damascus clip. clip. We yeah. got made for him. Yes. Uh, and it just had like a standard, you know, milled or. Yeah, it was like a Pena Mula clip. It was yeah. just a Pena oh, wow. Mula. And we, it's a couple of those, but it was fixable. So it was stuff like that. Nothing like terrible or nothing too crazy that's ever happened. You guys, like, I, I realize I, I I put you in a terrible spot. We've been talking about how great your work is. And then I'm like, no, tell me, tell me about your failures. No, I mean, no, it's, it it's, it's, that's part I mean, of it, okay. you know? So like anodized. Oh my God. He's super fluffy right now. It's like. But um, anodizing is one of them. That is honestly, it's so funny. Anodizing and acid etching blades. Those are the two mods that everyone can do at home. And they are the two most inconsistent mods yeah. you could possibly do. Like they are the highest, like they are more likely to go wrong than um, rock patterning or any of the other ones. Like it doesn't, it just, they're so finicky. So, so finicky. Now, I mean, if you slip when you're rock patterning. Oh, yeah, that's like, terrible. Okay, yeah, you know what terrible. I mean? But, yeah, the thing is, you'll do everything right with acid stone washing and electrolytic anodizing. And they'll still and go Sometimes wrong. you'll just get a dark spot on the blade or something. And then same with electrolytic. Or, yeah. you know, sometimes titanium just won't, it just won't take the anodizing no matter what you do. You'll, you'll learn that it's maybe not the best grade of titanium because like lower grades oh, of titanium yeah. can, um, they don't want to anodize the same or way. Or sometimes it is grade five and you'll anodize yeah. it and you'll redo it a ton of times, refinish the scales completely, blast them again, and you'll just get the same spot in the exact same location. Yeah, that's awesome. uh, Primarily with higher voltage colors, uh, anything yeah. above around like 55. Or even higher. Usually, yeah, it's usually like, yeah, 55. Yeah. yeah. Well, so what what do you find of all of this? And by that, I mean turning uh, your knife modding, which was once a hobby, into your business. Mm -hmm. What what aspects of the business part of it do you find the most difficult? Mm -hmm. So the business part of it, um, I mean, I think it's just, you know, everything as a whole. Like, we've never had our own business. Yeah, learning uh, how to run a business. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. the whole business part I mean, the whole, is yeah. Is the difficult. business part. Uh, trying to manage, you know, um, everything from, you know, responding to messages on Instagram and managing our time. Managing Manage our time, time is, is difficult. That's it. It's that difficult. is the hardest Because our shop is at our house. So We're in a garage. It, it's difficult to, you know, like. If he wants to work on something and I want to work on something at the same time, and we both need the two by 72 and oh, we only yeah. have one two by 72, <clears throat> I have to like jump around to another order to find something that I can work on that he, you know, we, so we can both be working at the same time. Um, and then what else business? I think, I don't know what other business. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just everything. It's yeah. all, it's all a learning process for us. Yeah. We, learning how to run a business. It's like this past year, things have just really blown up. So mm -hmm. just, you know, it, it's a challenge. Every yeah. part of it is a challenge. Yeah. 
from a, from an outsider's perspective, it seems like you've uh, em- embraced the business part of it because uh, you you seem to have a uh, handle on your marketing. And by that, I mean, you regularly post your work on Instagram. I mean, like regularly. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and that's a great thing. You are um, you have your own live shows in which you speak with you, with your fans. Uh, you, you put up your videos. You do great work. It did not take long. You know, and, I, and I'm not I'm not saying that's a guarantee or anything, but in, in uh, you know, when I got in on you, I, it didn't take long to get the work. It was right. it's it's immaculate. And uh, so I think you you guys are even though you're feeling your way through small business ownership, <laughs> I think you're doing a great job so far Thank you. by those things. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, And I yeah, I think just being a part of the community also has helped us like making new friends and word of mouth has, I think has been like the biggest thing yeah, for definitely. us, word of mouth. Um, and that's like our biggest marketing as far as marketing goes was like word of mouth through just people re- being recommended to us or um, some friends, like we're friends with Stasa and Stasa or Kev from Lefty EDC. We always joke that he's our door to door salesman yeah. <laughs> because every time he has someone on his live stream, he's like, "Have you heard of Knife Mod?" Yeah, he'll have like <laughs> he'll have like Leong Ma no, or like so, someone that has a production knife company, and yeah. he'll just like bring us up, and he's like, "Oh yeah, you should think about uh, put, <laughs> getting your knives modded." Yeah. Have you heard of Knife Mod? And that has actually worked out for us. Like we've yeah. had uh, Asher contact us. We haven't done anything with him yet, but EMP EDC. That oh, was nice. uh, through Lefty EDC. We actually have 40 of his knives in right now. And um, we did a run of 40 uh, earlier. Like recent, a couple weeks ago. ago few, yeah, a few like weeks that. ago. Yeah, and we're also going to be doing another run with, speaking of runs, uh, Urban EDC Supply. So oh, we're great. going to be doing a, just a small little batch this time. I think it's going to be three stovepipes, Spiderco stovepipes that are going to be coming in that we're going to be doing bark, um, I don't have to look at the email, but yes. <laughs> That's pretty good. Cool. I just uh, spoke with Dave Ridbaum. He's uh, he's our this week's podcast. Yeah. Uh, uh, I love his work. I, I've I've been following him for seven years, and that particular design, that stovepipe, mm-hmm. when he makes it in the XL version custom. Yes. Oh man, yeah. I think, to me that is just an absolutely stunning knife. So I I want to ask you guys, what kind of advice? can you give to, I'm not talking about people who want to become you and become knife modders and make a business, but guys like me who've got a whole bunch of knives, I'm pretty handy. I have a bunch of tools. I don't have mills and stuff like that. So what kind of advice can you give uh, to someone like me who's got a case full of knives and might want to start tinkering? What's the best thing to Mm -hmm. start thinking about and to acquire? Um, So acquire uh, for tools, tools, tools wise. One yeah. by thirty. If you don't have a belt, I, I know you have like a uh, what is it? Three by forty-eight. Uh, two yeah, by forty-two. Yeah. 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 Nice. Perfect. That's even better. Um, so yeah, definitely get a belt sander. If you have nothing at all, grab a one by thirty from Harbor and Freight. It's, great. it's it's great. We used that for probably like a year yeah. before we upgraded. Um, yeah, I mean it was pretty recent that we got our two by seventy-two. Uh, definitely a Dremel. That's an easy one with mm-hmm. a flex shaft. Um, yeah. Carbide bits. Um, you're going to want to get a buffer. I mean, depending on how much you're looking to spend, yeah. but you can start out with a Dremel easy. And you can go to Harbor Freight and get a buffer. Yeah. You know, yeah, and e- buffer mills are cheap. Uh, you know, and compound then is cheap. Also, you could pick up, uh, before working on your titanium knives, which are, you know, generally over $50, it's very um, expensive. you could pick up titanium plates on uh, eBay. They even have some on Amazon now. Oh, okay. No yeah. way. Uh, yeah. so those are great. Like, dude, that, that is literally how I figured out like all of the textures I do now so you practice before you do it um, on your expensive knives. So right. yeah. There is, there is one thing of it though. Like when you're doing it on the plate, it's like, yeah, you could look at it. It looks cool. But when you haven't done it on an actual knife, it's hard to imagine what it's going to look like. So at it's some different. point you do just have to take the plunge and just do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything that we've learned has been through trial and error other than maybe a couple tips here and there in the beginning from Mm -hmm. uh, some people like anything knife related on Instagram. He he helped us a lot when we started. Yeah. He was Um, awesome. But yeah, get a Dremel and just mess around. Do your research though too. Like, I mean, this is the beauty of social media. Like you can, you know, follow your favorite modders and like, you can see, you have so much inspiration now. Whereas before I know I've talked to Matt Christensen about this. He said, you know, that we have an advantage because we had social media to draw inspiration from. But in his generation, him and Tuff 
Like they kind of, you know, paved the way for other modders. They had to like just wing it and figure out what worked and what didn't. So make sure, you know, do your research and draw inspiration and just have fun. True that. I mean, that, that sounds like, that sounds like great advice. Um, but I got to ask you one last question sure. of all of the processes. Now we've talked about the tools of all the processes. Uh, what is, uh, is it easy to just jump into anodizing? That's the one thing that I'm yeah. like, man, it, I have. It, it, it is. is. It yeah, is. It that's really the is. easiest. That is the first thing. Like you get some, get some fair chloride and you get. Or, your... or wait, anodizing? No, I'm saying the two things oh, gotcha, that you can gotcha. do at home that are super easy. Acid wash and standard electrolytic anodization. I actually have a video on our YouTube channel. It is the how to anodize. It's the very basics. It tells you all the things that you need to buy, the things, uh, just the things that you need to get started. It's pretty much like anodizing 101. And then in the description, there is links to everything that you'd need to buy. A lot of the stuff you can get from around the house or from your grocery store, things like that. Right. Um, but that is like the first thing that we ever you know yeah, first thing yeah. we ever did and it's so much fun and her video is like super straightforward very to the basic point. yeah uh and then if you can't afford a power supply you can literally just get some nine volt batteries and chain them together that was how we did it at first and then that way with anodizing you can experiment with different finishes as well like you can sand it bring it up to a mirror polish with some sandpaper mm -hmm. Uh, you can figure out how to do satins and anodize over that because every surface finish will give you a different look yeah Wow, guys, thank you so much for coming yes. on the Knife Junkie podcast. This is awesome. I, I, uh, sometimes you just need someone to encourage you and to, uh, lower the hurdles for you just a yes. little bit. Uh, anodizing to me, uh, was like alchemy, you know, uh, yeah. you send the knife out and it comes magically back. And I know there's <laughs> electricity involved and that scares me, you know, but, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I really yeah. appreciate it. And, uh, I, I look forward to to having more knives modded, but I guess I better get on your books real soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks for having us on. It was fun. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great. My pleasure. Take care. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase. And now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long sleeve tee, or on a pillow, coaster, tote bag, coffee mug, water bottle, sticker, pen, or apron. And with COVID-19, you definitely need a don't take dull for an answer face covering. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie with your don't take dull for an answer merchandise. Get yours at www www.thenifejunkie.com forward slash dull. That's www.thenifejunkie.com forward slash dull. I'm pretty sure we're going to be taken off of YouTube for mentioning COVID-19. Uh, something that happened uh, a while ago um, before what's happening now. Anyway, it was such a pleasure to have Lindy and Richie on the show and man alive. If you can get on their books or if you're interested in this kind of work, uh, go to their Instagram page and check out the beautiful things they do with the production knives. And now I know custom knives sometimes, uh, that we all know and love. You'll be glad you did, uh, check in with us next week for another uh, interview with another great knife world person. Also check out Wednesday supplemental show and Thursday night, live 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And we will talk then. Until then, uh, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.